Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Tuck of Siege. My name is Jason Marlowe, and I am the lead pastor here. I just wanted to welcome you to Tuck of Siege today, and I hope that you're having a great weekend. We have had just an awesome time at Vacation Bible School, and honestly, just right now, I want to take a moment to just say thank you to everyone who participated, who volunteered, who got here early, who stayed late. So thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. Now, see, I paused there because you guys are supposed to be clapping for these people. That's better. And you better be clapping or else it's going to be really weird. So guys, honestly, we had a great week. We got to see a lot of stuff and a lot of kids got to hear about Jesus. And more importantly, we got to glorify God by serving these wonderful, wonderful kids and their parents. And we're happy. Hopefully some of you are here today, came to Vacation Bible School, and you're here today to see your kids perform. And we're going to get right to that in a moment. And, or maybe you're here today because you're here to watch one of your friends or family members get baptized today. We have so much going on at Tuck of Siege, and we are so excited. I'm even more excited that my good friend and our pastor here at Tuck of Siege as well, Chris Schubert, is going to be bringing our word from God today. And I just want to be able to say thank you once again to all of you. I'm not able to welcome you in person because the Marlowe's are journeying off the map this week. We are taking our vacation Bible school to heart and we are going to be out on vacation, but we want you to know that our thoughts and our prayers are here with you guys. So I'm going to welcome us, uh, open us up in prayer, and uh, we'll get ready to start this worship service right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Vacation Bible School. We thank you for the children who came through. We thank you for the workers, and we thank you more importantly for today, an awesome day that we get to celebrate these children and these youth, and Lord, we get to celebrate these baptisms, these people taking a private faith and making it public. And God, just more importantly, just an awesome opportunity we have to gather together and just celebrate you and what you've done for us. God, I pray that you would be with us today, that you would bless this service, that you would open our eyes, that we would see you, our ears, that we would hear you, and our hearts, that we would be welcoming you into our life today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Y'all have a great day. Wonderful time. Celebrate and glorify God. Guys, how you doing? Yeah. Baptism Sunday, right? Um, so I'll be honest with you, it's the first time I've ever done this. <laughs> a little nervous, a cry for help, so much. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, but seriously, guys, every single time I sit where you are for Baptism Sunday, I'm thrilled. You know, like, I, I always, my wife and I were talking about how, how the other day my, my face is like a default not smile, you know? And I have to work hard to smile, but I'm telling you, when I sit in that seat and I watch people get baptized every single time, I can't help but have a big cheesy grin on my face, you know? So uh, I, I love it. Um, but baptism for us, guys, is awesome because it pictures what happens in salvation, okay? So we go from, from this private faith where we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, but it's just us, and then here in front of all of you, we say, guys, I just want you to know I'm part of the church. It becomes public. That's a beautiful thing. So uh, you guys come on down. Alright, Trenton. Trenton is uh, one of our youth. He got saved at camp this past week, and uh, a lot of the kids went forward. Uh, <laughs> Trenton didn't go forward. He uh, he actually he actually was uh, was sitting there in his chair, and I just talked to him after. I said, "Man, you know, I said, do you know you're a Christian?" He said, "Yeah, I'm a Christian." I said, "How do you know you're a Christian?" He said, I asked Jesus to be my savior. And I said, well, when did you do that? And he said, right there, when everybody was walking forward. He said, I just said, I want you to be one. So, uh, so he's sure, and uh, we're happy to have that. So, do you have a profession of faith in Jesus Christ? Do you have a profession of you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? Alright, 
Uh, Kathleen, uh, me and Allison got to know her from Second Baptist Day here. My, my wife works there. Hanson um, and Patty are in the same class together. So uh, we've got to know them really well. They come to our life group. She's been faithful to that. And I've just been watching life change happen in her life. And it's just been fantastic. So. amazing what happens when you see what the gospel looks like and you can look at it and you can see it and you can see it happen and that's awesome I love what Christ is doing at this church I love what Christ is doing through you it just uh, uh, through we've been here six years now and to see and just watch this whole past week of Bible school and people coming in here and they're so tired. They've worked all day. They come here on two wheels to get here on time. And then to see all the hard work, all these blue shirts in this congregation is just awesome. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. We uh, had just funny how God works. Um, we didn't put this. Uh, we, we're doing a series on classics 2.0. Last summer, we did the Old Testament stories. This year, we're doing the New Testament stories. And I picked this story out just, you know, weeks and weeks ago. And then this week happens, and it was awesome. We're going to be in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 is where we're going. And whether you come from a church background or an unchurched background, you've heard the story about... The Good Samaritan. You've heard that story, I'm sure. Um, let me ask this. Do you remember McDonald's years and years ago? You used to could go there. Maybe you can now. It just doesn't seem to be as cool as it was back then. But you could go and have a birthday party at McDonald's. Do you remember that? I mean, that used to be a big deal. You'd go to McDonald's, and the girls would come out, and they have their little brown visor and their uh, brown polyester pants, right? And, I mean, they just made it all about you, right? That's when they had the playgrounds at the fast food restaurants that were unsafe, okay? Right? I mean, it was, it was awesome. And just the service was crazy. So, and, and nowadays, um, you know, we could go through... Uh, fast food restaurant after fast food restaurant, but one kind of comes out to mind. Um, which one would that be, do you think? Chick yes, Chick-fil-A, you Christians. That's awesome, right? <laughs> so, right, it's Chick-fil-A. I mean, they are almost to the level of being obnoxious with their service, right? I mean, you could have a drive through line 18 miles long, and in three minutes, man, you're at the door, right? They're saying, hey, how can I help you, my... That's right, right? It's just crazy how much they are into service. My question for you today, though, is why is it when we think about service, we have to think about a fast food restaurant and not the church? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that, right? Now listen, that's, and trust me, that's not an indictment on Chick-fil-A. I mean, they are awesome. I think it's a ministry in itself, okay? It is. But that's more of an indictment on the church. More of an indictment, right? Because it seems like what we're known for, what we're known for are the things that we don't like and we don't believe in. That's kind of the, the portrayal that we get. 
more of that instead of what we do believe in. When we do believe in the goodness and the greatness and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, that allows that to happen, right? We just tend to get caught up in all of that. What I want to talk about today and to make sure that we understand is simply this, that saved people serve people. Saved people serve people. A saved person will naturally serve people. You can't help it. You can't. Now listen, let me, let me validate this. When I say a saved person, I don't mean a church attender. There's a difference, right? There's a difference. There's a difference in somebody who is a true follower of Christ and a church attender. And if you have doubts and questions about that, we'll need to talk maybe at the end of the service. But if you are a true follower of Christ, you, it's not something you even have to try to do. It'll happen naturally. Save people, serve people. That's what we're going to talk about in the good story of the Good Samaritan. Here's where I'm going. Leave no questions. If you are a Christian here today, you are called, you are gifted, you are equipped, you are empowered to serve Jesus through his local church and outside the church. You are called, gifted, equipped, and empowered. And we're going to talk about how that happens and what that looks like in this story. Luke chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 25. Luke 10, 25, let me just set this up. Right, Jesus, when he was active and his active ministry was happening, there was constantly going with him kind of a conspiracy, right, by the Pharisees and by certain groups to try to get Jesus and trap him in trying to contradict himself, right? They were constantly trying to do that to the point that these groups would hire professional lawyers. The more things change, the more they stay the same, okay? would hire professional lawyers to follow Jesus and try to trap him, right? So they could tweet or Facebook or blog or whatever about the things he was saying, all right? But they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. And that's the context of this story as we go through it. Luke 10, 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. We know that that in itself is ridiculous. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It, here's the kind of weird thing with Jesus. When Jesus was asked a question, you look back in, your, in the scripture, he never gave an answer. Jesus never gave an answer. He would do one of two things. One, he would ask you a question back, or he would tell a story, right? So, how, what must I do to inherit eternal life, right? And this is what he says in verse 26. What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? In other words, you're the professional lawyer. You're the one getting paid by the hour. You tell me what it means, right? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's what sounds familiar, church. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Look at this. You have answered correctly, Jesus said. Do this and you will live. Ding, 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 right? Winter, winter, chicken dinner. He's got it. But he wanted, verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself. It seems like we feel like we always have to justify ourselves with Jesus. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And who is my neighbor? And this is where the fertilizer hits the fan for this, this story, okay? Because it totally shapes this whole thing. Number one, I'm going to take you through three, uh, three things that uh, I think we need to look at as we go through this scripture. All right. Number one, we must learn to see as Jesus sees. We must learn how to see as Jesus sees. All right. One of the things that I'm learning in life is that as I age and as I grow, and some of you are going to snicker at this, all right, but the, the more that I grow and as you mature, you see life a lot differently. I'm seeing life a lot differently now. For an example, okay? Um, I grew up, when I was a little guy, um, 
I grew up on um, what they called Mill Hill, okay? Mill Hill, and this was in Cramerton. And uh, so that's where we, I learned to ride my bike, okay? Learned how to ride my bike. Now, when I did that, we had this big hill that we lived on. How did you learn how to ride your bike? You, stopped, you started at the top of the hill, and you went down, okay? That's, I'm, I'm not kidding you, right? Inevitably, every time, somebody would fall. And you remember this? You fall, you skin your knee up, right? You go crying. Your mom would bring out this can of Bactine. You remember that? Hey, baby, it's not going to hurt at all, right? <laughs> ah, right? I mean, it hurt like crazy, okay? But what do you do? A couple minutes later, you're back off, and you're going back up the hill and back down. My kids, they learned how to ride their bike. They weren't allowed to, and now, now let me say this. When we were going down the hill, there was no helmet, there was no knee pads, there was nothing, right? My kids can't ride down the driveway without a helmet, right? I mean, that's how things, things have changed. There's no way Shannon Sheeper will let Preston and Morgan on their bikes without a helmet. It's not going to happen, right? And here's another example. I'll show this picture. I don't know if this means anything to anybody. That's a 1978 Oldsmobile station wagon. That in itself is awesome, okay? It would take out two parking spaces across the road. But that's, listen, that's not the best thing about the 1978 Oldsmobile station wagon. This is the best thing. That's what I'm talking about. That's right. Listen, in those cars, they may have had seat belts, but most of you cut them out, right? Let's be real. This thing, we would pile up in the back of this. This was the original third row seating, okay? We would pile up in this thing and take off, and it was a death trap. But it was awesome. It was awesome. There's no way they would let anything like that happen (laughs) happen today. But more things, they change. You see things in a totally different perspective. But here's the thing. Christian, if you aren't changing in Christ, if you aren't changing in Christ, you're not truly following. It's not. You're not. You can't be in Christ and not change. All right? You can't follow Jesus and stay the same. Any way that anybody that you see that followed Jesus in the scriptures, they were consistently and constantly changing. You cannot follow Jesus and stay the same. We have to see as Jesus sees. So as we continue to pack, this story is loaded with gospel, okay? Verse 30, in reply, Jesus said a man was going down. A man was going down. That's very important. From Jerusalem to Jericho. From Jerusalem to Jericho. And I think it's important to stop and explain the significance of the Jerusalem to Jericho. Okay? Um, the distance was about 17 to 18 miles. So it's a, it's a pretty good hike. They didn't have a 1978 Oldsmobile to get them there. Okay? It was a pretty good hike. And the other thing that's significant is there's a 3,000 foot drop in elevation. From Jerusalem to Jericho, right? So just just to put that in context as we go through this. Now, Jerusalem was known as the city of blessing. The city of blessing. Jerusalem was the place that people went to commune with God. Jerusalem was the place that you went to go to have your sins atoned. Jerusalem was the place that would be the place that eventually where Jesus would be crucified. Jerusalem was the city of blessing. And then there's Jericho which we know as the city of cursing. If you know the story of Jericho walls, right? The Israelites go in, they blow their trumpets, they march around it seven times, and the walls fall down. And then Joshua, who led that, went in and kind of cursed the city, right? He said, listen, the first person that comes in here and builds this city back, their firstborn will die. And then the person who comes in and builds the gates back, their secondborn will die. Sure enough, what happens? Somebody comes in, they build the walls back up, their firstborn dies, they build the gates, the secondborn 
sign dies. And some people kind of look at that and are like, Jesus is just mean. That's just mean of Jesus. Well, listen, if Jesus tells you not to go play in the road, and then you go and play in the road, who's stupid? <laughs> right? I mean, really, it's, let's be real. Right? That's what he has, right? You, I mean, so, it's just we, are our, we, make, we make things hard on ourselves, okay? So, this man began to walk from Jerusalem to Jericho. This man began to walk from the city of blessing to the city of cursing, right? So I believe in this room right now there are people that have chosen to step out on that journey. And you're going from a good place, from that city of blessing to a not so good place in Jericho and a city of curse. And listen, no one's ever, ever, ever improved the quality of their life by walking away from Jesus. I promise, ever improve their quality of life. But that's what we do, right? There are people now, you're wrestling with a decision that, that's on your heart and it's been on your heart for some time, right? Do I walk away from Jesus? Do I walk away from what I know he wants me to do? Do I walk away from that relationship? Do I pursue that business deal? We've got decisions to make. But let me show you in the scriptures what happens every time, every time, every time someone walks away from Jesus. Again, in verse 30, in reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Right? Listen, if you choose to walk, I'm not a prophet, okay? I, I, but I have been in ministry for about 15 years. And that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. John chapter 10 tells us that the enemy is here to steal and to rob and to kill us. It's a real, it's a real battle. It's a real enemy. Right? And some of you have walked down that path to Jericho from Jerusalem. And maybe you, some of you haven't, but you have family members that are on that journey right now. What do we do? What do we do? Right? They're on the side of the road. And just like this, they left this guy. They're on the side of the road and they're naked and they've been beaten. And they're a mess. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Right? And let me tell you, let me tell you this. If you have that person in your life, and you come across them, and they're beaten, and they're on the side of the road, a sermon or a song probably isn't going to do it. Okay? A sermon or a song probably is not going to do it. Right? Well, then, Chris, how, how, then what do I do? How can I help? I'm glad you asked. Verse 31. A priest. A priest. Let's talk about a priest. It's important that we see this. A priest. Get this. Memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. Okay? The first five books. In many cases, he, they memorized the entire Old Testament. That's who we're talking about, a priest. All right? So the Bible says a priest. It's very important to notice that a priest happened to be going down to the same road. Right? A priest going down to the same road. A priest going from the road of blessing to the city of cursing. That's pretty interesting because... Even in the church, we see people doing that. They're going from a life of a blessing to a cursing. The only difference is sometimes they just get wearing a Christian T-shirt while they're doing it. Right? Going down. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. That's crazy. Think about that. A priest passed going down the road. He saw the man and he passed by him on the other side. The Bible says that he clearly saw this man in front of him and he chose to go across the street on the other side. He chose to keep walking. Why did he do that? Maybe because he had to get to his Bible study? Could that be it? Maybe he had to go to his life group meeting? Think about that. Listen, don't take me, I mean, listen, don't take me wrong when I say that. We've got to have Bible study. We've got to strengthen our walk with Christ. Okay? But at the point that Bible studies and life groups, right, propel us to arrogance instead of propelling us to action, 
it's wrong. Okay? We've got to keep that in context, right? When our Bible studies hinder us from helping somebody who has been beaten on the side of the road, we can't live like that. It's got to propel us to action. A person that can't take part in a Bible study and then walk right by a man, right? I don't see that as a problem that you don't know the word or that you don't understand the word. I see it as a problem that you don't live out the word, right? We've got to see as Jesus sees. Next person we see is we see a Levite in verse 32. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he saw him, he saw the guy with the mess beat out of him, passed by on the other side. Now listen, let me just, a Levite. When we talk about Levite, this is a person who was very active in church activities, okay? Very active in the church, all right? But I'm confused because, listen, the two most qualified people to help this guy passed him by. Passed him by, right? And maybe, maybe the guy was thinking, you know what? I just don't feel significant enough. Maybe that's his excuse. I just don't feel significant enough to be able to help this guy. Here's what I would say to that. If I could sit down with each of you, and I'd love to do this sometime, over a cup of coffee, regular, not decaf, (laughs) because that doesn't count, all right? Here's what I would say. If you are a Christian, you are called, you are equipped, you are empowered, and you are expected by Almighty God to get off the bench and get in the game. Listen, Jesus did not pay the price that he paid for us so we could go be trophies of grace on his shelf. You got me? All right. The price that he paid was so significant, right? I mean, one day, listen, one day it's going to be awesome. We're going to get to live with him forever. But until then, while we are on this earth, we are called We are equipped, we are empowered to go out and get people that are lying on the side of the road who have been beaten and had the mess beat out of them and bring them and love on them and show them what the church is truly supposed to be like. That's what we're to do. Well, and then then sometimes, let me say this because this is a great example. There's a, just last week, I had a guy from this church come to me he said, Chris, listen, I, I, just, I work a busy schedule. And I'm there as, absolutely as much as I can. I want to plug in. I want to do things. How about this? All right. I, he says, I'm really handy. If you would just give me a punch list and keep me a punch list of things that need to be done around the church, as my schedule permits, I'll just come in and I'll start knocking those things off. See, listen, it, that, that's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. It's not some grand sermon that you have to stand up. That's not the expectation. The expectation is to see a need, see a person on the side of the road, and go and meet that need, whatever, whatever that looks like. And some people would say, well, I'll tell you what we need to do. Let's go call those people at the church. Let's do that. Let's go call those people at the church because we know know in society that there are always those people at the church. Right? We have these people that sleep here at night, okay? And the love and action alert goes off, right? They come down the poles and they go in room and they're meeting this need, right? Or go, now they're going over here and they're meeting this need, right? That's what happens. And then they go back until the next love and action alert goes off and here they are again. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, Tucker Siege. You are those people at the church, You are those people, right? We are the church. We are those people. We've got to step up. I see all these blue shirts in this congregation, and I can't thank you enough, right? But we are those people, whatever the need looks like, whether it looks like a punch list, whether it looks like a beaten dude in the road, whatever it is, we are those people. Well, Chris, I'm just afraid that God would ask me to do something Out of my comfort zone. Listen, that's one problem with that. He crucified Jesus. Do you get that? 
He crucified Jesus, a God that would kill his own son for you. I have a feeling it's not going to be uncomfortable asking you to dive into an uncomfortable situation. It doesn't come more uncomfortable than that. We were the person on the side of the road. And he sent his son into an uncomfortable situation to reach down and save each and every one of us. Don't talk to God about being uncomfortable. You know what he would say? It's called the cross. You want to talk about it? It's okay to be uncomfortable, church. And then we see an unlikely hero. The unlikely hero in verse 33. And he does something very unusual in verse 33 to where he makes that most unlikely person in the story the hero. But a Samaritan, do you understand who a Samaritan was? Huh? They was hated by the Jews. Hated by the Jews. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. In other words, when he saw the man, he felt compassion. He's the only person in this story that actually saw as Jesus saw. And if we want to embrace that fact, we've got to understand that saved people serve people. And we've got to look at people from not what they can do for us, right? Not what they can do for us, but what are you called to do for them? But you don't know me. I can't do anything. I can't do anything significant. Chris, I don't have, I don't have the tools. I, don't, I can't get up here and sing. I can't get up here and preach. Here's the problem with that. Acts 4, Acts chapter 4, 13, we see Peter and John. And they're talking, and the people referred to them, listen, this is really cool, as unschooled, ordinary men. Unschooled, ordinary men. That word, that phrase in the Greek is idiotes. Guess what word we get from that? Huh? Idiots. Idiot. Right? I'm an idiot. Right? God used a his, has a history of using, using idiots to change the world. Right? So don't it's not that you don't have the tools. God has gave you every single thing that you need for the thing that he's called you to do. I promise. All right? We have to see as Jesus sees. Number two, we have to respond as Jesus leads. Bear with me, uh, Joel Lutmer. Anybody here got pulled over lately? <laughs> it's okay. All right? If it wasn't Joel, it's cool. Okay? Yeah, some of you are lying. All right? <laughs> Nobody has seen, all right, so let me just back up. And I know you'll agree with this, but I think in our society today, there's a word that we become uncomfortable with, and that word is authority. We've become uncomfortable with the word authority. We don't like that, right? I mean, listen, so nobody's gotten pulled over, right? And the first thing that happens and, and you think is, oh, thank you, Jesus, right? Thank you for that authority that's protecting me. Officer, you are awesome. You ever heard that, Joel? A few times. All right, good. I hope they were from this church, all right? <laughs> we don't think of it that way. Listen, we, I was coming home from the beach one time, and it's the, I think it's the only time that I've got pulled over with Shannon in the car, all right? It was, in, it was in Florence, South Carolina. That's not like right next door, okay? I get pulled over in Florence, South Carolina, and she wore me out for two hours, okay, <laughs> about that. Another time, this is awesome, another time, another time, um, I was coming through Cramerton, and um, we were almost getting ready to pull into our neighborhood, and the kids were little. I had both kids with me. They may have been five or seven, and I get pulled over right when I'm turning in, right? And if you, if you know and love my Morgan, okay, who's my oldest, right, Morgan's like, she's got to know what's going on, okay? She's got to know, and if she doesn't, she's going to worry about it a little bit, right? So I'm going to have fun with this. I said, honey, listen, it's not, it's not a far walk home, okay? I think Daddy may be getting ready to go to jail, okay? But it's going to be okay. Just, just walk home, okay? You'll be okay. And it was nothing serious, okay? All right, I didn't get arrested, just for the record. All right, that's never happened. All right? But, um, you know, sometimes we just have an issue with authority. But listen, being a follower of Christ, being a follower of Christ is simply 
simply coming in line with authority, with authority of the Savior. All right? And, and today I think God's trying to pull some of you over. He's trying to pull some of you over and get your attention and have a chat with you and make you understand that saved people serve people. Listen, listen. You hear a lot of uh, every week about love and action, what that looks like. Okay, listen, and, and don't, we don't need an audience. We don't need an audience here, all right? We need an army. That's what we need, right? We don't need an audience. We need an army. We don't need spectators. We need participators. That's what we need, okay? Listen, I love sports. I love them, okay? Um, I've, my whole life I've played sports, okay? But it, it just boggles me when we've gotten, we're pulling for our favorite NFL team, right? And us, the fans who have never played a down, know nothing about it, are yelling at the coaches and yelling at the players on what they need to do that they've trained their whole life for. That's what we do, right? You do that. You yell at the TV, okay? You maybe write letters. I don't know. I've never met an athlete that said, hey, hold on, coach. This guy up here. Yeah, I think he's got a good idea. I think he's been playing a lot of Madden on PS4. I think he's got it going on. Let me see what he has to say. Doesn't happen, does it? That doesn't happen. All right, we've got to change our strategy. Verse 34, he went to him. He went to him. Because when you see as Jesus sees, that's what you do. You go to him. If you want to be like Jesus, we have to get to go to the guy that's wounded. Why? Because he came to us. That's why we have to do it. Right? That's why we have to do it. The Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for the extra expense that you have. Listen, we're going to talk about two ways real quick that we've got to be involved in the local church. Right? You have must, you must have spiritual involvement and you must have physical involvement. We've got to have both. First of all, spiritual involvement. We see here that the Samaritan used oil and wine. Oil is significant. Anytime that you hear oil, um, it's in correlation with the Holy Spirit, right? To symbolize the Holy Spirit. Anytime you see wine in, involved in the scripture, it's used to symbolize the blood. All right, so there were spiritual implications used in the way that this guy was helping. So we've got to be involved spiritually in the church. Chris, how do I do that? Simple. Pray. Would you pray for your church? We say that a lot, but we don't often do it. Pray for your church. Pray often. Pray hard prayers. Pray big prayers. Listen, our pastor sat up here um, at the very first Sunday of this year and said, hey, I think God wants us to baptize 100 people. And if you're honest with yourself, and if I'm honest with myself, thinking, dude, dude's crazy. There's no way. There's no way. That's what we did. But church, is it really crazy to think that if he could do it in here, he can do it in here? Do you believe that? We need an army that believes that everything that God can do here, he can do here. And he can do in Mount Holly. That's what we've got to have. We've got to be spiritually Involved. Listen, I love this scripture, Isaiah 62. <laughs> this is awesome. Isaiah 62, 6 and 7. I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourself no rest and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Let's give, listen, let's give God no rest. That's what the scripture says. Let's wear him out as a church on the prayers that we're offering to him. Let's beg him to save souls. Let's beg him to bring people in. And we will have a baptism service every Sunday, not just the first Sunday. Let's pray that. Let's pray those big prayers. He's a big God. Let's don't limit God by us, by us and what we ask for. I want a church that knows how to pray big. Pray big prayers. We serve a God that can do it here, that did it here, and He wants to do it here. Pray for your leaders. I say that unashamedly. You better pray for Jason Marlowe every day. 
You should pray for Emily Marlowe every day. You should pray for Grace Marlowe every day. You should pray for Cade Marlowe every day. You should pray for Gaston Christian School because Cade is starting kindergarten <laughs> every day. <laughs> Tommy, let's edit that out so the preacher doesn't see that. <laughs> pray for Matt. Pray for Allison. Pray for the boys. Pray for me. Pray for my family. Listen, I, will let, I, have, I have let you down. I've let many of you down. And I'm probably going to keep doing that because I'm a sinner. And I apologize. Pray. When you say, Chris, well, you say that, but I don't really know what to pray for. Go ask him. Ask Matt how you can pray for him. I'm sure he'll tell you. I've never met anybody that wouldn't answer that question. Right? Pray. Pray for leadership. Finally, we've got to have physical involvement. All right? The guy here says that he picked up the dude on the side of the road and put him on his donkey. Have you ever tried to pick up somebody dead weight? Hmm? Weekend of Bernie fans? Anybody out there? I love that show. Right. Have you ever tried to do that? Pick up a dude, walk, throw him on a donkey. That ain't easy. Listen, God's called everyone in this room to get their hands dirty. God's called every person in this room to break a sweat. God's called every person in this room to do something tough for the kingdom. Now listen, y'all bear with me, okay? Here's all I'm asking you today to do. Shannon's getting really nervous right now. Here's all I'm asking you to do. This is the best shirt ever. Right? This is all I'm asking you to do. All right? I need you to get off your donkey and serve. I do. I've seen it. I see it every week here. I see it every week. I see people serving. I see Jimmy Horton get here every Sunday morning, the first one here, just to simply make coffee. And if you don't notice, he's also loving on your kids at the same time. That's what it looks like. That's after he cleans the kitchen, by the way. That's what it looks like. It looks like somebody coming and saying, Chris, I have a crazy work schedule. Just give me a punch list and I'm going to go to work. That's what it looks like. One of the reasons, listen, we are, if you don't know it, we are in a church revitalization. That's what it's called. That's, that's what it's called that we're going through, right? To where you take a church that had been struggling on decline and you turn it around. There are two other kinds that happen. There's a restart where you just push the reset button. You close the church and when you're ready, you start it up again. There's a recycle that happens to where the church dies and they just bring another church in to use the building. Those are the easy way out. That was the easy way out. What you're going through is a church revitalization. And it's hard. And it's, it's been hard. But I can stand here at the first Sunday of every month and watch people getting baptized. So yeah, it's hard. We've had to get our hands dirty. We've had to reach people and pull them out on the side of the road that have been beaten. But I stand before you now seeing how God is moving and seeing people coming to Christ. I saw blue shirts everywhere. Show that slide. I saw blue shirts everywhere this week that were giving everything they could to our children and loving on them. Of them spent more time in the bathroom line than they did in their classes. But they were loving on your kids. Come on, I want you to stand up. We're getting ready to praise Jesus in this place. They were loving your kids. It was hard, and they worked all day, and then they came to this place, and they worked hard here. And guess what? Two kids.